Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Navani. Together with my uh, some of my favorite Bitcoin podcasters, Daniel Prince of Once Bitten and John Vallis of Rapid Bitcoin Fire, um, we we thought you know we might uh, give it a try and um, get out a little bit of the echo chamber and have a challenging discussion with Lawrence H. White, uh, professor of economics at George Mason University and senior fellow at the Cato Institute. And because, uh, you know, since uh, I, I listened to uh, an interview, a talk uh, with Lawrence H. White on Nick Carter's podcast show, um, I had the impression, you know, that Lawrence H. White is a reasonable, open-minded, critically questioning and, 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 um, and reflective uh, person. So uh, without further ado, yeah, let us dive into this discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, fundamental questions. Uh, uh, what is money? What is good money? What is hard money? Uh, what are the fundamental monetary properties of gold and Bitcoin? What are the weaknesses? Uh, is is gold a free market uh, money or, or is it actually Bitcoin? Because it needs no permission because it's permissionless, decentralized, uh, absolute scars non-controllable that's i think the fundamental point uh, uh and this is uh you know the one of the unique uh um you know desires uh, and 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 intentions of 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 all of all of us bitcoiners we we want to get rid of the, you know we want to eliminate the control over money once for all for, for all um in order to evolve you know into a higher human civilization on the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history and that is bitcoin so yeah so we're looking forward to that video my this is my uh, podcast is roundtable edition with john Vallis, Daniel prince featuring lawrence h white let me know your questions your comments afterwards and thanks so much for support and for listening okay welcome to the show lawrence white Thank you. My name is Kevin Davani. We got here John Vallis, Daniel Prince, all podcasters. Uh, so, Lawrence, uh, maybe I can start off. I mean, I've been really, I was really impressed with uh, the talk you gave uh, or the, the interview you gave to Nick Carter, and because you made the impression of me, you know, you you're like not only open minded but you, you are um, as a professor of the George Mason uh, University, if I'm correct, and correct. senior senior yeah. fellow of Cato Institute. Uh, maybe it would be a wise, uh, what do you guys think that, you know, Lawrence, could you get like a brief uh, background? Like what's, what's your expertise? What's your, what's your uh, special focus uh, when, because on your Twitter handle, it says you, uh, you, uh, you, um, someone study the private currencies. Um, Since before they were cool. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Back in the. Well, back in the 1980s, I was uh, inspired by Hayek's monograph on denationalization of money. And I wrote my dissertation on the free banking system in Scotland and the debate in Great Britain, in London, whether to have a free banking system in England, whether to eliminate the monopoly privileges of the Bank of England, which was a movement for a time, but the Bank of England managed to quash it. Uh, but since then, I've been interested in uh, private alternatives to central banking and schemes like uh, e-gold and Liberty Reserve and the Liberty Dollar, so-called, which was a silver-based currency. And since Bitcoin came along, or since one of my students told me about it, I've been trying to stay informed. Uh, it's, a, it's a learning process. Uh, it turned out, I, I discovered I had written something predicting that Bitcoin couldn't really exist <laughs> before it was launched. <laughs> so I, I've learned from that, not to, not to uh, think that we have all the answers. Uh, but I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm interested in Bitcoin. I'm interested in the, I, I know it's a shameful thing to say, but I'm interested in the other altcoins. <laughs> Uh, to see if they have anything to add. Uh, but yeah, that's my perspective. So I, I'm living and learning and, uh, you know, may a thousand flowers bloom is my attitude. I have certain 
expectations about what the market will and won't support, but uh, I'm willing to be shown wrong on that. Would you say is the overall intention like um, of yourself or the work you do in the context of the Cato Institute, the George Mason um, University, is like, can we like agree, like what is the overall intention to create a free market or, or what's the, what's your overall like vision? What's the purpose? Yeah, that would be my purpose. So I'm affiliated at Cato with the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. And as the name suggests, it's to provide a forum to discuss alternatives to the status quo. So that includes the gold standard, that includes dollarization, currency boards, certainly also includes cryptocurrencies. Uh, and I guess our main policy concern is that other options not be foreclosed by decree or by diktat, that the the market is the place to trial new monetary systems, not, they shouldn't be foreclosed. Yes, and then within, within the status quo, we try to think about what's the least bad thing that central banks can do, given that we've got them, but. Would you say that, um, because there's an uh, sort of a intellectual or I don't know some kind of discourse going on back and forth with a bunch of Bitcoiners who also wrote uh, you know uh, some articles or discussions going on on um, do we need to wait for the free market or could you could you say that you know could we say that Bitcoin is the free market? Bitcoin's an initiative in the free market. I don't see any government supporting it or subsidizing it. So yeah, I would say it's a free market project. It wasn't even a for-profit project when it started. Now it's surrounded by all kinds of uh, supporting firms, but the core of it is a, you know, an, what social innovation, I guess. Um, that's, we have to see how, how widely it will catch on. But I yeah, think, there's a market in, w in which it's competing with alternatives. I think, uh, Lawrence, if you're okay with this, before we kind of get into the meat of the discussion, I'd be interested in hearing, you know, because it's, it's what you teach and, and have studied for a long time, you know, especially in the landscape that we're in today, uh, which is extremely um, unique, for lack of a better term, what do you think is the solution to... Uh, you know, the approach to a monetary standard or monetary policy in the context of, of what we're dealing with today? You know, what do you and and uh, the people that kind of take the same view as you advocate in terms of, um, you know, better money, a better money system? Uh, I'm actually writing a book with the working title, Better Money. <laughs> uh, so, so I should, I should so plug the, that here. And, and it's about it, Bitcoin? It's, the subtitle is the subtitle is gold fiat or bitcoin. Oh, nice. <laughs> Got it all. Okay. Very good. Yeah, so that's that's the horse race. But um, so I have argued uh, that there's good reason to think that in the context in which silver and gold standards were the best commodities uh, to serve as monetary standards. But we're in a different day and age now. Uh, gold and silver have been demonetized. And so it, it's a tough question. How do we get back to letting the market choose among monetary standards, given that governments dem uh, dominate the base now? And so the, the minimum uh, is for them to get out of the way of allowing other standards to emerge privately. But if uh, I think there are very strong network economies where people want to use the same monetary standard that their trading partners use. And that means uh, there's got to be a question about whether we want to continue the fiat dollar or fade it out in favor of something uh, more reliable. We're not at a stage where there's any kind of consensus on doing that, though. Lawrence, if. Um, 
Hi, this is Daniel speaking now. Hi, Lawrence. Um, thank you for doing yeah. this and um, facing three podcasters. We're, we're not here. <laughs> this isn't a lynch job. This is, um, you know, to open a discussion. Um, we, we all listened, I think, uh, to your interview with uh, Nick Carter on, on his podcast. And there was one thing there that, that really stuck with me. And it's when you gave an example about um, people in their home countries when they start adopting a different currency uh, in, in, right. in favor of their own currency. Now, I've seen this firsthand. Uh, and I remember in the late 90s visiting Bali in Indonesia. And if you go to a bar, or if you go to a restaurant, even the hotels were asking for US dollars. Um, even the guy that took you out on a guide to the waterfall, he wanted US dollars because he knows that's how he's going to get to feed his family in the next week or two. Um, now, this, kind, this might be a bit of a reach, but I want to throw it out there. Um, and I can't talk for every podcaster. Uh, maybe these guys can um, weigh in on this. But you know, my listenership, when I look at this, 45% of my listenership is the United States. And I've heard similar figures from other people. Now, is that a signal to you that perhaps the United States are now turning towards a different currency and are going to start favoring something such as Bitcoin? other than the US dollar? Well, it sounds like uh, your listenership is distributed about the same way the US dollar is around the world. About 45% of it's in the US, and about 65% of the dollars are outside the US. Um, no, I, I think dollarization, some, what's sometimes called dollarization, which is what you're describing, uh, from the bottom up, uh, is an important phenomenon. And too much of the dis academic discussion of dollarization has been from the point of view of the bank, is it a good thing? Well, no, not a good thing from the point of view of the local central bank, but from the point of view of people who want reliable money, it's a good thing. And by studying these kind of episodes, we can see that people do vote with their own pocketbooks uh, for a better money. Uh, what's kind of surprising is how high a local inflation rate it takes before dollarization starts to take off. But I, in the U.S., there's a lot less of a concrete reason to be concerned about switching to another currency because the dollar is not hyperinflating. Right? Inflation's been pretty low. Uh, and it seems to take at least double-digit inflation before people uh, seriously start looking for a better money. Uh, so in a way, I hope that there's never a crisis of the fiat dollar, that it continues to be reliable, but we should be prepared for the day when that uh, is no longer true. Um, I'd like to, to go back for a second to something, uh, Lawrence, you said uh, just before Daniel's question there, and it, it kind of centers around how this all came together in, in the tweet that I originally put out. And yeah, I think a lot of Bitcoiners would uh, rebut the arguments by, you know, the free banking proponents or the gold proponents to say that those have been uh, tried in the past and for a period of time they had been, you know, a relatively uh, stable means of uh, facilitating free market exchange. However, they were always right. susceptible to being stopped ultimately by state intervention. And I think what, you know, what Bitcoiners would probably suggest is there's, why would we think that a return to any one of those standards or, you know, monetary systems would net a different result in the future? And in fact, the reason, what, ma what, what makes a good money is not that it functions well when it's permitted, but that it doesn't require permission to function. And just the last point on that would be that you know, thinking of this in terms of, you know, we all want free markets. I think that's a given for at least everyone on this call and a lot of people probably listening because free markets are a manifestation of our individual freedom. And I think, you know, we all generally want that. But it's, sure. I, think, I think what the argument that I would make is that it's not the free market that permits the money. It's the money that permits the free market. And in that context, Bitcoin seems to my mind to be the only one that truly permits a free market to exist, whereas previous manifestations of a monetary system or standards have always relied on the permission of 
the powers that be to allow the free market to persist, but if they wanted to intervene, they always could. So Bitcoin seems to be the first manifestation of a type of money that is resistant to that, uh, to that oppression or shutdown. And that's, I think, why there's so much enthusiasm around it, because it may very well be our first, um, you know, first example of a, a true free market uh, being enabled long term. Yeah, no, this is an interesting question, and this is what you and I were talking about on Twitter. Uh, so it's a problem uh, that a gold standard and a banking system on top of a gold standard is out in the open, where if the government wants to quash it, and there's not sufficient ideological support to stop the government from quashing it, it's susceptible to being quashed, and historically, uh, when a crisis came along and the government said, well, now we need to switch to something else, the public went along with it. So that's a problem. Uh, but I think censorship is also a problem with Bitcoin if it wants to come out in the open and be above ground. And if you have governments that want to post prices in Bitcoin and the government says that's illegal, then you have a problem. Uh, it's not the fault of Bitcoin, it's the fault of the government, of course, but I think there's, there's a, it's a matter of degree how much uh, exposure there is. Peer-to-peer -peer exchange, uh, while keeping it all hidden and cloaked, uh, but it's hard to get mass adoption that way. It takes a certain amount of technological savvy to operate that way. Uh, whereas most people are more comfortable with, you know, making payments using their cell phone or some kind of swipe card. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think a, a gold standard would last if we went back to it tomorrow, which is the point you were making. It's going to take a public understanding of the issues and readiness to uh, stop governments from interfering with it than we currently have. So I, I see it as a educational mission. Uh, but it's important to keep the theory and the history alive so that it's on the shelf when we need it. And I I've certainly have no objection to people putting themselves on the Bitcoin standard or putting themselves on the gold standard or in the case of dollarization, putting themselves on the dollar standard if it's better than their local currency. Um, Lawrence, can so, you ask? I mean, I, I, do, I do see that censorship resistance as a, as a virtue of Bitcoin. Um, I guess what I would question is whether that's sufficient to uh, make it a widely adopted money. Okay, Ivan, did you have something to say? Yeah, is the core of Bitcoin, you think, Lawrence, I mean, um, you know, in order not to, you know, make the same mistakes or not to, I mean, it's about the control over the money. I mean, this is, uh, I think Bitcoin was born, as it's called, immaculate conception, <laughs> to to be the free market money and to to be um, just going to call it black market money, uh, but with exponential increase in liquidity, network effects, uh, a critical adoption rate, or you might have heard today, even whether it's top down or bottom bottom up or whatever, uh, Paul Tudor today, which we were just talking before you, you came online, uh, he just uh, he compared Bitcoin now to to the to gold to the in the seventies as for now, you know, as a hedge against the monetary inflation that we are about to face. Um, do you think it's like a precipice money? Like it's, it's never been done before. So what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to achieve uh, making the control of money obsolete for once and for all. Well, I mean, that's a good goal. <laughs> and I think under historical uh, free banking systems, on centralized gold standards where there wasn't a central bank where there wasn't central control over any one stock of gold reserves 
it was a system that was decentralized uh, and not under any one party's control. But it does involve uh, having vaults and if banks want to do business above ground, then they are able and they can be forced, if it comes to that, to turn over their gold, uh, which is what historically happened. But you're right, I think you're right, that today, most people who hold Bitcoin are not holding it to use as a medium of exchange. They're holding it as a for value. Um, and it's, a, it's another question whether that could be the basis for uh, launching an alternative payment system in a, you know, a large way, in a mass adoption way. Um, guys, uh, I think um, I'm getting some some bad sound. If we turn our videos off, it might improve. I don't know if um, if you guys are suffering that as well. Yeah, I, I am. Heard so I'll, turn, yeah. I'll, I'll turn my video off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. And um, sorry, John, I interrupted you there. Go ahead. Um, no, I, I was just going to kind of, um, I guess, add on uh, Kayvon's point that I think um, th this is one of the fundamental uh, reasons why people are interested in Bitcoin, because it does take the either the control of the money or the power to issue currency uh, away from the state. And, uh, it, you know, yet it, one of the, pri the prime ideas is not that it's necessarily completely unconfiscatable or completely censorship resistant. It just ch changes the dynamic of the attack surface such that it's far more defensible. And this makes it far more resilient to intervention by those who, who might seek to, to disrupt it. But to the, to the other point you were making, Lawrence, about you know people are holding it as a, a store of value and not a medium of exchange right now, to that I would say, Generally, I agree. I mean, obviously, the community, uh, th there are projects and people are trying to foster, um, you know, the, sp the spending of it kind of in, in very novel ways. But I would say right now you're right. But I would also say that that's quite logical and rational. If we are indeed seeing the monetization of a new form of money, as we've seen, you know, a number of times throughout history, uh, and of course, none of us were back then, uh, back there and perhaps writing didn't even exist when those events happened. So we don't have much um, context on them. But I would think that if it became obvious that a, a, an upgraded form of money were available and it was in the process of becoming adopted by a broad enough base to eventually use as a currency, then I can imagine that rational thinking actors would look and say, well, this is a better form of money but it's not evenly or, or broadly distributed yet. That means there's going to be additional, you know, substantial additional demand coming online over the next X amount of time. So it behooves me uh, to, to store it, store my wealth in it right now. And, you know, kind of uh, aggression's law dynamic where I, I'm using the, the lesser of the monies available until such time that it becomes uh, broadly distributed um, the volatility evens out and it over a process of time, of course, it doesn't all happen at once, but it slowly becomes used as currency more and more and more until uh, it's the dominant currency. Well, I think there's something to that scenario. I wouldn't call it a Gresham's law dynamic because Gresham's law operates where there's a legally imposed exchange rate between two currencies. Uh, but it does operate or it could, in, in the optimistic scenario, operate something like spontaneous dollarization, where at first people just keep their savings in dollars when the peso begins to misbehave. And then they begin to follow the exchange rate day by day. And so they begin to post prices in dollars. And then they begin to accept uh, payment in dollars. They don't go out and buy buy dollars whenever they want them. They actually will sell goods for dollars and uh, accumulate them. Uh, and once everybody's familiar with the, the value of the dollar, then they can begin to you know, use it as a medium of exchange. That's actually the last step uh, in spontaneous dollarization. Right. Uh, but the, the thing about Bitcoin that we haven't discussed yet, which concerns me, 
uh, as a barrier to its use as a medium of exchange is the volatility of its relative price or its purchasing power. Uh, now, if you're, if you're used to prices in pesos, the dollar to peso exchange rate bounces around a lot. You might think the dollar is too volatile. Uh, but once you realize that uh, the volatility is almost all in one direction, <laughs> that is the peso is dropping against the dollar, then uh, it's okay uh, to keep your money in dollars even though some of your transactions are still in pesos. Uh, but there's a, there's a different sort of s stability of purchasing power of the dollar against goods and services than there is in the case of Bitcoin. And unlike uh, the gold standard and unlike dollars, uh, the supply curve for Bitcoin is perfectly vertical. There's, right, there's nothing in the program that releases more Bitcoins when the purchasing power goes up. Unlike a gold standard where a high purchasing power of gold will prompt gold miners to dig a little deeper and that'll help stabilize the purchasing power of gold. And so we see the relative price of Bitcoin has much more volatility than uh, the dollar to Euro exchange rate or even the dollar to gold exchange rate. Something like seven to 10 times more volatile. And so that, that's an obstacle the people wanting to hold it as a way of keeping their rent money. I agree. And um, it's, I, I think it's one of the biggest shames of, um, of Bitcoin at the moment, because it's the, it's the more risk tolerant that are more likely to, to buy and um, to, to, you know, use the turn of phrase hodl. Whereas really, you know, I, I think I speak for Kayvan and, and John here. Uh, we would love to see, um, you know, the third world countries um, having a much bigger appetite to, to buy and, and, and hold this, this asset, because this is truly what we believe um, is going to lift many, many people out of poverty. But with, you know, to your point, Lawrence, like this, this volatility is just too wild at the moment. And I just wonder where that, where, where, what's the inflection point? What's the price point that we cross where, that volatility starts flattening out a little bit and those with, um, you know, less risk tolerance, uh, start entering the market. And that's obviously what's really going to, you know, drive hyper Bitcoinization. It's just a shame. It's going to be at much higher prices. Um, do you have any thoughts around that? Well, I don't know how a higher price reduces the volatility. So I'm, I'm not quite following your argument, I guess. A larger market cap. So if, the, if there was a, mar a Bitcoin market cap of $50 trillion versus $150 billion, then it takes up a larger share of, let's say, global money. And uh, also that would indicate that its distribution is likely more widespread. Uh, so I, I would think that that would diminish volatility. If, if, we, if we assume that people are adopting it because it's a better form of money looking toward it, becoming money in the future. And so, and, and you know, and, and while I have the floor, I'll just say this on Daniel's point. I mean, I, I, I agree in an ideal world, sure, it'd be great if, you know, people who needed quote unquote better money the most were the ones that were able to access it. But, you know, that's, that's not the world we have. And I think volatility, um, even though it is generally in, in the, you know, in the upward uh, trajectory or direction, I think it's, it's, it's unavoidable. If people are genuinely looking at this thing as an upgraded form of money, the hardest money that there ever will be, that there ever has been, um, then there's gonna be a, a lot of demand for that. And along with you know, those waves of demand will come the speculators, will come the people that try to game the market, et cetera. But I think the reason why we're seeing the, the, you know, the price generally trend upward is because every time this happens, more and more people are buying it with the view that it will one day become money and as a result they're holding it and i think on the the price stability issue i think you know my view is that is a perspective that's come out of us always having supply elasticity with every form of money we've ever used and we've never had to consider or contemplate 
uh, supply inelasticity with money. But, you know, I think prices reflect the ever-changing preferences between millions of people and billions of transactions at any given moment. And price stability will be an emergent property once the adoption of a given form of money is widespread. And any manipulation to its supply to stabilize prices will simply distort the natural market mechanism that, it use, that, that is using the money as a means to establish exchange ratios or relative value between millions of goods and services. So like I said in our, in our Twitter exchange, Lawrence, I think rather than being detrimental that supply can't adjust, I actually think ultimately it will be seen as kind of the holy grail of money, but the process of getting there will be, will be volatile. And I, I don't see any way around that. Um, and you know, that's obviously part of the time we're in now, but I think with greater adoption and with a greater share of, of global money in the form of, of market cap, Bitcoin's, Bitcoin's market cap, I think um, ultimately volatility will stabilize. And let's just think of a, a scenario in which Bitcoin is the dominant global currency, then I think the increase, you know, Bitcoin's, let's say it's deflationary, I think the increase in purchasing power on an annual basis will probably roughly reflect, um, you know, growth, uh, GDP growth or productivity growth in the run of a year as more, uh -huh. as more money is required to transact in the added amount of goods and services in an economy. Yeah, so it's interesting you use the term hard money, hardest money. Uh, I mean, there are two aspects to that. One is nobody can manipulate the supply. And the other is that the supply is fixed. Uh, to contrast Bitcoin to the gold standard, when it was an automatic gold standard and not under the manipulation of central banks, uh, you had the first part, you had a money supply that nobody could manipulate, but it wasn't a vertical supply curve. The supply wasn't fixed when the purchasing power was uh, high because of say rapid growth in the real economy, increasing the demand for transactions purposes, as you were just saying, uh, more gold would be mined by this decentralized competitive gold mining industry. So, there was a response, but it was an automatic market response. It wasn't centrally orchestrated. Uh, and, and I see from the point of view of money users an advantage to having this force that dampens volatility in the purchasing power uh, in response to supply and demand shocks. It's true that uh, by having a fixed supply curve, Bitcoin does avoid supply shocks. Uh, and the classical gold standard did have supply shocks. There was the discovery of gold in California, for example. Uh, what people don't often appreciate is how small the supply shocks were because the ratio of gold flows to gold stocks is very small under a gold standard. And so even though the California discovery probably doubled the rate at which gold was being extracted, that meant it went from something like uh, two, two and a half percent a year to five percent a year. And then it petered out as the gold mines became depleted. So it didn't have that much impact. It caused maybe one and a half, one to one and a half percent inflation for about 15 years. So pretty trivial by modern fiat money standards. Uh, but with that, disadvantage of a gold standard that there can be supply shocks comes the advantage that you do get an endogeneity you get more gold being produced when it serves to stabilize the purchasing power of the gold unit which seems to me advantageous to mon most money users would like that so i can i can see that you're looking forward to a future in which there's no longer speculative holding but just transactions holding of bitcoin uh, and then the only variations in demand we have to worry about are variations in transactions demand, which there's no reason to think is very volatile. Interesting. Is that what you're thinking? Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think, I guess my, I, the, this, my disagreement, and it, it would be a hard one for either of us to prove, is 
the, the benefit of stabilizing purchasing power. You know, because, you know, what that, having a stable purchasing power, why is that preferable to having an increasing purchasing power? So if you're dealing in a deflationary currency, then over time it's increasing in its purchasing power. So why would people prefer a stabilized purchasing power than the increasing? Well, if it, if it had the same volatility day by day and the average was zero appreciation for one currency and 2% a year appreciation, that is falling price second currency, then I agree with you, the second currency dominates. But the thing about Bitcoin is not only that it has been a pretty good investment if you're willing to hold it for long periods of time, but that it's a very dangerous investment if you're looking to get rid of it by the end of the week in order to pay your rent. Well, I have no disagreement with you there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it not in the context of a short-term investment, but in a you know, long-term future of, future of money context. What is our best option for a global currency uh, into the future, right? So yes, you know, there's no argument for me on the Bitcoin is short-term short volatile. The, the, you know, my, what I'm saying is, I think things that stabilize prices are ultimately distortions in the natural process of ex you know, finding exchange ratios between all the millions of products and services and people making those decisions. And I think given the choice, I'd rather have a deflationary currency than, the, than one that just simply pres preserves its purchasing power. Well, I think our current fiat regime is very distortionary when there are huge injections of money specifically into financial markets. Absolutely. Um, but that wasn't the nature of the classical gold standard. There the money is diffusing out of gold mines through uh, economic exchanges, purchases by the gold mine owners and such. Uh, it's not in any really noticeable way distorting relative prices or financial markets. But how then is it stabilizing purchasing power? Well, the supply of growing. Uh, right, right. So all I'm saying is, you know, again, given the choice of a deflationary currency versus one that just maintains its uh, purchasing power, so not inflationary or deflationary, um, you know, I, I, I certainly know which one I would choose. <laughs> no, I think that's right. Other things equal, including volatility, then people would choose the appreciating currency. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. I wonder, that, guys, that's actually a very standard argument in the theory of monetary policy. Sure. Uh, Milton Friedman would, made this argument back in the 60s that it's better to have an appreciating money than one that's flat or losing value from the point of view of the people holding it. Yes. I wonder, guys, if, um, sorry for jumping in, I'm just listening to both sides here. And um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, like, you know, if there's, kind of like a misalignment on, on time horizons. Um, we're, we're both talking about, um, we're, we're all talking about uh, money of the future. Um, I think it's, I think we're just programmed naturally to think the future is, you know, the next five to 10 years. Uh, I, you know, for me personally, when I think about um, Bitcoin and I think about um, the future of money um, to use that phrase, and you know, I, I won't speak on John's behalf, but for me, I see this as generational. This isn't, five to 10 years for me. This is 100 to 200 years. Um, so I just want to put that out there and, and see if that might um, change the conversation a little bit. Um, John, if, if you wanted to um, jump in next. Well, I, I would just say I agree with you. Now, what, whatever our, our individual predictions are on how long it will take for Bitcoin to, Bitcoin to monetize or to become you know, the dominant global currency, is it 20, 50, 100, 200 years? Who knows? But to your point, yes, absolutely. I'm not thinking about this as, as something I'm going to pay my rent with next year or take profits on in two years. You know, and, and in that context, actually, in, in practice, Bitcoin is not volatile at all for me because I'm never looking, I'm not looking to sell it at, you know, at any point in the foreseeable future. So it is very much a, you know, I'm holding this, what I believe to be better money uh, in, in, in as part as contributing to its monetization um, over the course of however many years that takes. And at some point in the future, when it has become monetized, when it is accepted as currency, when the technology has developed to make it easier to use in practice, et cetera, 
then I, I might consider doing so. But you know, I, you're, you're absolutely right that um, that should be stated that this is, we're not looking at this in terms of a short-term investment to get rich. We're, we're looking at this in the context of the next evolutionary step in the history of money, which is, a, you know, I know everyone on this call, I'm sure thinks that's an incredibly rich field of study and I'd recommend it to anybody but in that these things often take a long time, these transitions from one dominant form of money to another. And so, yes, I, I agree with what you said, Dan. And if I can ask you, what's your feeling about Bitcoin supporters on Twitter who like to jump on every time the price is up 10% and do a victory <laughs> laugh? <laughs> I, I, I think, I think I, I'll let everyone chime in, but I think, um, you know, this is, Part of the, the reason why Bitcoin's been able to be kind of under the radar a bit is because of how it seems on the surface. You know, I've interacted with a lot of Bitcoiners over the years and, you know, they're often very educated, studied, uh, articulate, articulate, thoughtful, etc. But there's, a, there's definitely a playful, rebelrous um, or rebellious attitude in, in the community. And um, for whatever reason, you know, I think we'll have to wait for the history books to be written to look back on and kind of parse why that might be. But uh, I think it's just people that are excited about the prospect of a form of money that's going to permit a dramatically different, um, you know, way of ex living, exchanging, um, a different type of economy uh, for us as, as human beings to, to uh, avail ourselves of incredibly excited of that prospect and, and the implications of it and on the journey of getting to that kind of end point i think they're you know they're having fun and they're they're watching it closely and and look e that all being said nobody's gonna you know everyone gets a little excited to uh, at the prospect of becoming richer you know so if you've been <laughs> on this journey for a long time and and you've been a, a, a you know a die in the wool supporter and you believe this is the future of money and you want to bring this future as you know uh, forward as fast as possible because of all the things that it means uh, and you know you see the the, the price going from ten thousand to twenty thousand or whatever one you're getting richer and that's always nice and two it's it's validation it's a type of validation though it waxes and wanes uh, from the market and so i think as that continues to happen people's conviction hardens more people are brought in people are 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 financially incentivized and financially free to pursue things that don't, you know, uh, like as Bitcoin's price increases, a lot of people in the community will become more financially free to maybe contribute to Bitcoin or pursue um, a, a career or life that's uh, more enjoyable or, or meaningful to them. And so I think all these things and more are kind of wrapped up in the excitement and the, the kind of oddness of, uh, of the of the quote unquote community in general. Lawrence, that, that's a great question. And I think we should all be put on the spot. So, uh, Kayvon, if, <laughs> if you, Kayvon, if you're ready to go, uh, go for it. If not, um, I'll go and give you a bit more breathing space. Yeah. No, let me, let me just say, because yeah, Lawrence, it's a good question. Yeah. Why do people, because I mean, that's the human psychology, right? I mean, uh, we are all, all of us in the Bitcoin community, we're all experiencing people calling us people, people, I mean, I've, I've have had no calls from people who have never had contact with for for years now and why not only because the number goes up but because you know everything is unfolding so it's what is you know the number go up meme actually showing it's it's actually showing manifesting expressing the resilience the the you know the i am right see i i was right we are all right in this and you know and it's 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 that's why we say you know we're not here for the money but for the money and uh you know, and it's, uh, of course, it's a, it's an inspirator. It's a, what do you call it? Like a motivator or it's, it, it shows us that it works right after 11 years uh, of monetary evolution. It's like 11 years. It's nothing. Uh, you know, I mean, I see, I don't see it in 100, 100 and 200 years, uh, by the way, um, Daniel, I, I, because, you know, after our talks, you know, with Jeff Booth, the author of price of tomorrow, he says that, you know, central banks, they're fighting against gravity. So the deflationary especially the technological deflation and deflationary prices are coming one way or another. We can't, we can't, you know, we can't fight against these forces. So it's coming anyway. So why not, you know, have already, this is why my question, which um, John actually articulated much more eloquently with me is like, 
you know, could Bitcoin be the one and only free market money? Because we don't have, because it's permissionless, we don't need to ask anybody for permission. It is born as a black market money for 8 billion people, essentially. Um, I mean, I don't know, am I wrong on this or? <laughs> I, I had another question. I had another, well, I was going to say, don't put me on the spot defending other gold bugs. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll finish off um, the, the, um, the, the podcast, the Bitcoin podcasters uh, defense on Bitcoin and your question, you know, what do we think of people that, um, you know, start uh, shouting and, and screaming and, and making a noise on Twitter when, when Bitcoin rises 10%. Um, Lawrence, my background was uh, in foreign exchange. I was a foreign exchange broker for uh, 18 years. And so I've been exposed to markets and volatility and seen people, um, you know, elated and broke in a day. Uh, it's, so when I see this um, kind of behavior on Twitter, I can sniff the traders. I can see who the traders are and they're just to be ignored. They are completely and utterly that they're not they're not grasping what's what's occurring that they, they, they just they will because this will be their, their first step into into this space but they're, they're not yet and then on the other side of um of the virtual coin are the people that are making the noise in a kind of um, mimetic way in a comedic way uh, of those people um now to the, the outsider looking in, it just looks like a bunch of noise, like a bunch of guys at a party. Um, so until you understand like the nuance of both sides of what's going on, um, then it's actually a pretty quiet place. When, when, you're, when you're in the middle um, and as a, a hodler, if you will, um, it, it, it is a pretty quiet place because Bitcoin is a pretty, yes, the volatility in the sticker price is crazy. But the technology and the protocol like is boring as all hell just and, keeps working right <laughs> yeah exactly um so yeah that that that's my response but it is a great question thank you well, well as a follow-up let me ask you this do you see the adoption of bitcoin continuing to grow uh at the desired rate uh, hasn't it cooled off a bit huh Good question. Um, hmm. First, first thing I would say, I don't think there is a desired rate. Uh, I think Bitcoin's going to do what Bitcoin is going to do. Um, it's you know, it's it's there for people to decide, and people will come to it when they're ready. What I think has been incredible over the first eleven years of Bitcoin is that um, people on the street have had a chance to get into a financial asset before well for for you know on the surface of what we think what we believe not what we definitely know but before governments before hedge funds before huge financial institutions before sovereign wealth funds before huge pension funds before banks um this this so far has been a very 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 slow adoption um and i think kayvan was was you know saying earlier um paul tudor jones today is now making a lot of noise and um uh, raul powell and dan tapiero huge dan moorhead as well huge huge funds now are coming in and what what does that what is that going to do to the price what is that going to do to adoption hello We're still here. Yeah. I'm still here. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So that that was that was my response. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Kayvon, do you want to? No, I see. I see the critical adoption rate. I mean, I just I just observe. I mean, I I have people around me who are who are now total Bitcoiners. You know, uh, and 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 i see you know more and more as things unfold you know with the economy crashing or whatever you know uh, there's like really a disaster going on right now uh, small or mid-sized companies or, or businesses so uh, i think i i i think there is a process of adoption on different levels merchants you know shop owners businesses you know 
Mm -hmm. uh, the average pensioner, uh, you know, who just may, maybe wants to, re, you know, save a little bit or uh, it's a saving technology, right? I mean, it, it's a saving technology. And, and I think uh, it will, it will happen si maybe even simultaneously, maybe even as it will transition slowly or maybe gradually and then suddenly into a medium of exchange. But I see that much, much sooner than we could even anticipate. But that's my, you know, my perspective. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, uh, sorry, Lawrence, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it, it, it won't take double digit inflation to drive more adoption of Bitcoin and of gold as investments if we get negative interest rates uh, in a big way. I think that yeah. will interest a lot of people in alternatives to holding fiat money. I, I agree with you. And I think despite th my feelings that uh, gold was the best form of money until Bitcoin and now Bitcoin is, I still think, you know, uh, to be, to put it somewhat uh, playfully, that gold's got a few pumps left in it because I think it's, it's so ingrained <laughs> into the world. It's been around for 5,000 years, you know, and there's a lot of people that still read newspapers despite the fact that the internet, you know, the entirety of the world's knowledge is available on your smartphone for you to curate your own news for yourself. Some people are creatures of habit. I, I don't think that will persist past, you know, more than another generation or two, but that's, that's just my, my, my personal feelings. And regarding the, the pace of adoption, I think, you know, it's, it's, I think it's proceeding a pace. I, I'm, as Daniel said, like, I, I'm more interested in whether the protocol is still doing what it's meant to be doing and it's very boring and unexciting, but the answer is yes. And I think it, the, the adoption won't be linear, um, but it, you know, and it changes as you go along. And just as a personal example, when I first bought Bitcoin, I sold it for other things. I, I, I thought it was interesting because it was money outside the hands of government. It was permissionless, decentralized, all the things that we've been talking about, but I didn't appreciate it to the extent that I now do. And so before, in an earlier cycle, I may have been the one, one of the ones selling because my, I was still maybe earlier in my education and my perspective on this thing to the, where the point I am now is I wouldn't think of it. It's, it's, it's not going anywhere because I feel like I have a greater appreciation for what it represents. So I think people will get drawn in on the hype cycles via, you know, because of greed, because of all the different things that draws people in and then market conditions may change a lot of people will be flushed out and there will remain people that say, you know, I'm, I, you know, I got burned perhaps, but I, I, I want to learn. There's something here. I'm sensing something. I want to learn more. And with each successive wave, I think the foundation hardens and that is, uh, you know, the, the growing foundation is what I'm concerned with, not the, you know, the blow off tops in, in each big hype cycle. So in that context, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, where we are after 11 years, and I'm uh, pretty darn excited to see what the next 10 years holds. Well, maybe we can have this conversation in another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Take so, stock. So, Lawrence, um, you know, should we put you on the spot then? And um, But I, I, I don't think... like. I guess that's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, not really. No, that that it was never the intention. Like you, you know, when the three of us, you know, dreamed this up, it's like, you know, here's here's a gentleman that you know he has a, a solid argument that we need to hear because we it's easy to get stuck in an echo chamber, and um, you know we we are just searching for the truths for for answers. Um, so you know. And John um, has been a gold bug. And as he said, you know, um, that there's plenty of price movement left in that to the upside. We all know this. And, um, you know, it, it certainly is not a bad investment. Um, Let me say one other thing on behalf of gold, mm -hmm. which is uh, blockchain technology is, is coming to gold markets, which is going to make it more transactable than it used to be. I'm sure you've heard that there's now a gold tether and there's a, another service called Glint, which is much the same. Um, 
what concerns me about them right now is that it's not exactly transparent what you're acquiring and what assets the parent company actually has, uh, how transparent they are about being audited and so on. But uh, assuming they could come up with some verifiable way of, uh, excuse me, of uh, taking custody of your gold and allowing you to transfer gold from account balance to account balance with other uh, people who have gold, uh, that could be an alternative transaction mechanism uh, when fiat money becomes more unstable. Mm -hmm. the, the, a big fear over Bitcoin is um, obviously um, it getting hacked. Um, it, you know, when, when noobs and, and beginners are, are looking at it, that's a lot of FUD around it. It's, um, you know, it can be easily stolen, easily hacked, um, internet money. Um, I don't know, like gold's been around so long. How many gold jobs have there been in, in the past? You know? <laughs> what, what would make, um, and, and bank robberies and whatever else, um, do you think it would make people more comfortable to, to now suddenly move to a blockchain technology just because it's on gold? Well, what people are looking for is uh, verification that the vault where your gold is supposed to be actually has your gold. Mm -hmm. Or if it's issuing claims to gold, that it has assets with which it can repay those claims. Um, and I, information technology makes it possible for you to monitor that from your desktop now, where it used to be you just had to rely on the uh, bank to honestly uh, audit itself or to be a member of a clearinghouse that honestly audited it. Um, so it comes back so to it, trust, Lars, right? I mean, it, it well, it, it comes trust. back. It comes back to mechanisms for verification. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I think I think that's the big distinction. And as much as free market competition can serve to, uh, you know, keep market actors trustworthy to a point, and you know, there there are many examples of this in the past. The problem is, is that it's still based on trust and verification. And that verification is based on trust. So, and you could, you could make an argument, I'd be receptive to an argument that there are, there are levels of trust that are required for interacting with Bitcoin as well. I just think they are far yeah. fewer. Um, and, um, and as a result, I, you know, I think any, any separation of, you know, using gold person to person is probably it's, it's, I, I'm more, most receptive to that argument, but of course, you know, there's, there's many challenges to that as well, but any separation between the individual and the actual money rather than a claim on the money invites, you know, uh, third party security holes invites trust. And I think if, you know, if history is any judge, it, you know, push comes to shove that trust can be, um, can be damaged or it can be withdrawn and then we have problems. And I think that's part of the reason why there's so much enthusiasm for Bitcoin is because if it doesn't solve that problem, it dramatically yeah. improves it. So the sort of the thrust of my historical work is that uh, banking systems work better than you might expect without deposit insurance and without central banks. And the problems of fraud and wildcat banking were actually very rare. Uh, it's it's kind of a colorful myth that populates some textbooks mm -hmm. uh, that these were big problems. Uh, they weren't, in fact. But I, I would put it this way, that there is a trade-off between uh, a, an absolutely trust-minimized exchange system and a, an inexpensive <laughs> exchange system. So trust minimization is costly, and sometimes it's cheaper to go with trust than to take every last step uh, to minimize the need for trust. Uh, and I think this trade-off was recognized by some of the pioneers uh, of Bitcoin. Uh, if you, I've gone back and reread the old writings of Nick Zabo and Hal Finney, and they're quite clear about this, that uh, what Satoshi did was to adopt a security protocol, which is quite, transactionally expensive 
in order to provide greater security. And sometimes we don't, and ordinarily I would say, we don't need that level of security to transact. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I, I don't have much argument with that. I think they, that's definitely a trade-off that they did make. And, um, I, you know, I think it, it, it's dependent upon how you judge that trade-off is dependent upon what you think is more important or what is lacking in the existing money system. Is it trust that's lacking or is it, you know, uh, cost-effective, cost-efficient transactions? Now, the answer is both, but I mean, where does your kind of ratio uh, of importance fall? But I would also say on that point in that I don't think Bitcoin... Um, I think it, it's focusing on the most important aspect first. And I think that is all the things about Bitcoin that allow it to be trust minimized, as you said. Um, and I think as Bitcoin is evolving, I think we will see efforts and ways and technologies developed to solve uh, higher or, you know, for problems that are uh, less fundamental for example, speed or, or cost of transactions later on and on a lower priority level than the foundation of trust. So if we can, if we can grant that we've established, you know, digital scarcity or absolute scarcity in the digital realm, and this is, a, this is something that we, we can have a tremendous amount of trust in because of its security and other reasons, then we can take that and develop solutions for other issues we might have further down the line, i.e. transacting in a cost-effective manner. And of course, I'm sure everyone on this call is, is aware of the ongoing uh, efforts and, and projects in order to do that, the Lightning Network being one of them. Can I just ask um, kind of a, a generational question? Um, we're, we're spanning generations here on this call. Um, Lawrence, what, what do you think um, somebody aged between like 15 to 20 right now would invest in over you know over the over the next 10 to 15 years as they you know uh, come of age and, and earning money and, and enter the workforce are they more likely to buy gold or bitcoin uh, uh that's a good question i suppose we could do uh, some kind of marketing survey to find out what current 15 to 20 year olds are buying uh, I don't know. I, I can see your point that people who've grown up with Bitcoin in existence are going to be more comfortable uh, with taking it for granted that it's there and it's an alternative and it works. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm 43 right now. Um, so, you know, any, anybody from, from my generation, anywhere, you know, age between like 30 and 50, out of my peer group and my family, uh, I don't know that many people that, that own gold or have ever really considered investing in gold. And that doesn't mean to say that they are now all investing in Bitcoin. They just hold money. It's just money. Um, so if that's my generation that are not holding gold because they just don't think of, it's like, how would they do it? First of all, would be the first question. And where would they store it? Uh, they, they they don't really understand yeah. like the, the mechanics of it. But, you know, I think like the generation coming behind us, the, or the two generations coming behind us, it's just going to be so native to them, so intuitive to them that I, Lawrence, well, then, I don't think it crossed their mind. <laughs> I just don't <laughs> think. <laughs> well, somebody's holding the gold because there's something like $8 trillion in monetary gold. That's not even counting jewelry. Uh, in the hands of the public worldwide. So that gold coins, bars, and exchange traded funds. And ETFs are the way to invest in gold nowadays if you want low transaction costs and you don't want to worry about storage. Uh, and those, of course, have been uh, remarkably popular. They've really taken off in the last 10 years. Maybe it's my peer group, but my, my, my peer group, um, very few of them even invest in stocks and shares. Um, I don't know, um, Kayvan, John, if, if you want to. Don't they have uh, pensions? Don't they have tax deferred uh, savings? Right, yes. Um, then that is done on their behalf, of course. So the, the, pension, the, 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 you know, the pension funds will be doing the investing on their behalf. And of course, they will have 
um, a certain, they would have diverse portfolio and um, managed portfolios. And of course, some of that would be in precious metals. Well, actually, it's, it's hard to get that into your tax deferred savings. It's possible, <laughs> but it's not usually one of the default options. Uh, John or Kayvon, do you want to? Um... Yeah, I just wanted to, in the context of gold, I mean, there are some fundamental questions. I mean, we still think about how did for you, you just mentioned that, you know, the market cap of gold has whatever, eight or eight, nine, nine or eight, eight um, trillion, trillion dollars. Yeah. Okay, how did it achieve that? And is it because it was already tied you know, for, for, for what, for, years, for more than 100 years to fiat? What about the transparency, the auditability? I mean, I can only rely on information I'm given. You know, when I'm when we talk about stock to flow, for example, it's it's said that okay, there is whatever two hundred thousand tons of gold on stock, and the flow is that. But mm -hmm. I could never ever audit it as I can. Like right now, I could tell you exactly, uh, you know, the 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 number of blocks, what is blocked, and and um, the num you know, and the Bitcoin is being mined. So. It's just the non-transparency and the lack of audibility that uh, I think starts already with the, with the issue of gold. What do you think, Lars? But no, that's a good question. I mean, I'm relying on figures from this outfit called the World Gold Council, which is basically an association of gold dealers uh, and gold producers. So... I have to hope that the interests of the gold producers and the gold dealers are not so perfectly aligned that they're in a conspiracy to fool us all about how much gold there is out there. Uh, but that's where the numbers come from. And it, it used to be, of course, illegal in the United States for citizens to own monetary gold. That was illegal from Roosevelt up through Nixon. Yeah. Uh, and when it became legal, people started buying Krugerrands at first, and then bullion, uh, and now they buy exchange-traded funds. Uh, in the rest of the world, of course, they've invested in gold for generations. And in a lot of countries, it's not even counted as an investment because it's in the form of jewelry, which is a separate category for the World Gold Council. But when people buy 22 karat gold jewelry in India and put it in a bank vault, or a safety deposit box and never wear it, <laughs> I think you have to consider it an investment. And it's I, precious and it, because it has a monetary premium, but you know, I mean, it yeah, could, because it can be sold back at a pretty, at the price of gold. Yeah. Plus but, a premium. Uh -huh. But gold could, like, lit, I mean, theoretically, uh, let's say, you know, something comes up, <laughs> like something evolutionary, like a zero to one technological innovation, or are they going to space or whatever? I mean, then, Relative scarcity of gold is gone. There's no scarcity at all then. I mean, the monetary premium could be lost, theoretically. I'm just, you know, daydreaming right now. But If we discover a solid gold asteroid, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, you know, and I, I, I agree with that, that, that there are, um, you know, potential uh, zero to one innovations that could impact that. But let's let's just assume that's maybe f f as far off that we... Well, actually, let's not make any assumptions, but I want to I want to address <laughs> I want to address something else because I think it has to be said, and this may not uh, be very attractive on just a, a fundamentals argument on the the monetary properties of Bitcoin versus gold, but I think it's impossible to separate interest in Bitcoin with the political implications that it represents, and as far as at least I you know, and this is my personal perspective from the conversations I've had, and it's probably more, um, more present in the younger generation. But I, I can tell, you know, people want change. You know, they, they look out on the world and they see the, the way the world is and has been running for a long time. And not only do they say, see inevitable change on the horizon in the form of a, a rapidly changing technological landscape and, you know, rationally thinking, whatever solution I choose today, I want it to be able to retrofit it for the emerging technological future that we're going towards. And I think that is part of the reason for preferring a technological solution like Bitcoin than a, you know, a more, uh, you know, forgive me, but archaic solution like gold. But I think people 
uh, people want change. They want change to the way the world works. And, you know, central banks around the world and the governments associated with them hold a tremendous amount of gold. Um, and the institutions that house and secure and sell is all part of, um, you know, that system. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people are looking at Bitcoin from the perspective that we, from the perspectives that we've, we've discussed already, but also from the perspective of, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to pump their bags. You know, I want, I want a, a form of money. I want to, I want freedom money. I want money for the people. I want money that's going to be fit for purpose for the future. And I want to take it out of the hands of, of those people that in my opinion have so egregiously mismanaged it and abused it for so long. And so I think it's, it, there is definitely for a lot of people, a political component to their interest in Bitcoin. I have to say that from my own point of view, somebody who's been thinking about these issues since before Bitcoin was launched, one of the things I love about the Bitcoin community is their awareness of these kind of issues. Uh, going to Bitcoin conferences, I finally met people who knew what the word fiat meant, <laughs> other, other than gold bugs. <laughs> and who were no longer under the illusion that we need central banks to manage our money for us, which is not universally recognized within uh, people who want to restore gold as money even. So, yeah, I think there's, there's a great deal of uh, education that people have done when they get interested in Bitcoin uh, into the rottenness of the current monetary system, which is all for the better. For Lawrence. All for the better for people to recognize it. Lawrence, do you mind if I ask a really loaded question? Okay. Um, and it's about education. And um, you, you being a professor of economics at, uh, at uh, George Mason. Um, in, in the economics that is, is taught there, is that, um, is there any part of the syllabus that is that focuses on the Austrian side of economics, the Austrian school? Yes, in our department there is. It's unusual among economics departments in that respect, but in our PhD program there is a field in Austrian economics, and a number of the faculty have interests in the Austrian tradition and work that into whatever course they're teaching. Uh, that would include me. That's great to hear, because um, there's, um, you know, I, <laughs> But that's not normal, is that correct? That is not normal, it's unusual. And why is that, do you think? And can you please change it? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> do, you, do you have any sway with like uh, any of the other uh, big schools? Well, what I can do at the margin is to supervise PhD dissertations and turn out new professors to populate the world with people who are uh, aware of these issues. And so I. That one of the reasons I came to George Mason was to, to do that, because I was previously at a place without a PhD program. Uh, but it, as you were saying, or someone was saying about something else, it's a generational issue. Mm -hmm. uh, science advances through the dying off of old professors, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which is a line I'm stealing from one of the old Austrian economists. Uh, and, and, and patents. But we won't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence, uh, I'd like to ask you, what, is there a trigger or, you know, what would it take for you to um, have any degree of confidence uh, that Bitcoin is becoming or is capable of becoming the dominant global currency? Well, I would want to see the number of accounts growing and I would like to see evidence of Bitcoin being used to buy goods and services and not just to swap back and forth with fiat monies. But would, would, would the buying goods and services not follow kind of greater adoption if everything we've been talking about in terms of recognizing a, a, an upgraded form of money and as a result hoarding it because of the, the, the point in the process that we're in, is, is it fair to to want to see that at this stage? Or are you saying you'd have to wait and see, you know, broad adoption as a store of value, and then after that, use as a currency and medium of exchange? Well, broad adoption as a store of value would be one thing, but it wouldn't be displacing the existing monies. 
in their role as media of exchange. And but what, what, but what if, what if, what if, Lawrence? Uh, that's a serious question. What if it 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 evolves simultaneously, uh, relatively simultaneously? That you know, because of all these things unfolding right now, maybe at a rate of speed we can't even fathom, that. You know the second third layer whatever lightning network payment technologies all these you know throughput transactions that people are complaining about about bitcoin what if it's this is achievable at the same time we get to a number let's say 300 million 500 million people adopting bitcoin would that like make you you know like confident and trust trusting well cer certainly more confident i'm not sure what the number is now but uh i would like to see retailers saying wow, the amount of business I do in Bitcoin used to be half a percent and now it's 5%. Now mm -hmm. it's 10%. Yeah, that's exactly the reason I wrote uh, this ranty article and get out my frustration <laughs> uh, a couple of days ago. I said, you know, we got to focus on the, on the merchants. I have, you know, I give, for example, you know, just an example, my girlfriend has a company, I own company business, and she said she would love to, you know, offer an alternative uh, payment uh, uh, infrastructure on Bitcoin but she doesn't have the time or the resource or technical skills or the knowledge. And what if it, you know, what if we figure this out, how to do this like really smoothly, user-friendly and, and, and safe and secure and private, private, you know, and, and with a high degree of uh, privacy. Okay, Van, if I can just ask you, ask you a question to turn a podcast onto a podcaster. If, if that was just like a, a one, two or three click process for your girlfriend to, to, put that on her store, her online store, would she then offer her service or product at a discount if accepting yeah. Bitcoin? Yeah, that's what we were talking about actually. There she would go. offer her customers five to 10% discount and say, you know what, download this app and pay with it. And this is what I'm, what I was so, you know, so, uh, so forward looking about a strike because I thought, you know, people don't even need to think about Bitcoin. Maybe they're even Bitcoin haters or ignorant of Bitcoin, but you know, they just pay. Whether they pay in fiat or Bitcoin, it doesn't matter because the merchant decides in what currency sort of, or you know, uh, whether in fiat or Bitcoin, the, the, the transaction is completed. So this is what I'm looking for. You know, this is, this is my big hope. So that becomes a double-edged sword. Once that technology is built and the merchants can use it, and then accept um, Bitcoin at a discount because they understand the store of value, that's surely going to drive adoption far quicker than we could ever have thought. Exactly. But it, yeah. isn't that what BitPay is about and other services that will accept Bitcoin on the merchant's behalf and make it all as seamless as accepting Visa or MasterCard? Well, I don't know much about BitPay, but I'm, I'm like from the infrastructure it should be like super, like, 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 uh, like bit, the Bitcoin qualities, right? Decentralized, uh, fully connected to your own node. And all you need is, you know, just the infrastructure and the, the customer, all, all what the customer needs is, a, is an app. That's it. Uh, with, however, that's connected, you know, to your, uh, you know, to, uh, to bank account, debit or escrow or whatever. I, th I think, uh, in light of current circumstances, and I know, you know, the, the deflation inflation uh, debate rages on currently with all the uh, central bank, um, you know, central bank uh, movements right now, activity right. right now. But let's assume that, you know, inflation rears its ugly head at some point, and it's, it's fairly aggressive, just for the sake of argument. I think a lot of people, especially in the Bitcoin space, have the opinion that okay i'm gonna i'm gonna hoard my bitcoin until absolutely necessary and if and when we a, a time comes where the money in use let's say the u.s dollar uh, has been so egregiously abused that it if not collapses you know is experiencing a high amount of uh, inflation or even collapses then i'll shift to using my bitcoin but until that time, of course, and when I said Gresham's law earlier, I just meant good money pushes out bad, not, uh, Lawrence, I take your point that it, it has, there's a, there's a legal tender or legal price setting component to that. But just right. that people, people will use, um, you know, the bad money as, as long as they're able. And then 
in preparation for shifting to a better money. And I think that's probably the mindset that a lot of people in the Bitcoin space have right now. I think it's interesting to look at uh, where at countries that are having very high inflation and see what's happening there. For example, Venezuela. And in Venezuela, there's an interesting competition between people who are resorting to the U.S. dollar and people who are using Bitcoin. Uh, and I have read a very interesting story about an individual who was selling his services, uh, some kind of consulting services, online and getting paid in Bitcoin and swapping the Bitcoin locally for Bolivars and using the Bolivars to buy his groceries because the store wouldn't accept anything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And other people are dollarizing themselves, uh, but both are illegal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, usually, I, the, the dollar, just, just because the dollar has this larger installed base of places you can spend it, uh, that seems to be the first choice in countries that are undergoing instability. Uh, absolutely. So I think maybe I should have appended to what I was saying is that if you have the luxury to save, that's a critical point. Because if it's money that has to be used to transact today, then yes, you're going to use the most transactable currency, the one that's accepted in the most places. If you have the luxury to have a certain portion of your wealth in savings, and I'm not sure if I misquoted Gresham's logic by saying good drives out bad, but bad drives out good. And I think if you have the luxury to save, then you'll spend the bad and hoard the good. Well, the good begins to drive out bad when people prefer to be paid in the good money and right. demand, and that, de- demand a big premium if you're going to pay them in the lousy money. And that's how spontaneous dollarization occurs in countries with high peso inflation. Mm-hmm. And perhaps, you know, we might see a, a process like that uh, happen with Bitcoin and the dollar at some point. Well, so then it'll be a, become a race between uh, people adopting Bitcoin and people adopting gold. <laughs> but right. uh, the, the gold transaction technology is not up to speed yet, uh, mm-hmm. but could become shortly. Lawrence, do you mind if I ask, and you obviously, of course, you can, you can say that you do mind, but do you personally hold any Bitcoin? Uh, not currently, no. I, I gave a talk in which I was paid in Bitcoin. And, and you sold it? I held on to it. I got it. When I got it, it was 6,000. I held it till it went to 10,500 and then I sold it. <laughs> well, there you go. There so you I go. think I did okay on that cycle. Yeah, yeah, not a bad trade. And I now have to fill in the tax forms to, uh, now that I've admitted it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> then where do you go, John? <laughs> um, Lawrence. Um, but I discovered you- firsthand the, uh, insult to your dignity that uh, know your customer represents <laughs> oh yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah. and are you i mean are you considering you know diversifying you know into bitcoin again as um a store of value for um you know perhaps a, a legacy portfolio um well so most of my saving well all of my saving really is done through payroll deductions and Bitcoin's not an option there as far as I know, but I, in a few years I'll retire and so I'll start managing my own savings. Uh, and it makes sense to diversify. And so that includes doing, holding a little bit of gold, holding a little bit of Bitcoin, um, just as a matter of prudence. Absolutely. Lawrence, are there, are there any, I know I saw from your website that you, do or have advised other cryptocurrency projects either currently or in the past yeah do you do you still uh, do do that and if so what is it about other projects that you find worthy of your support or interesting well they came to me and said they were interested in hiring my consulting services i said i'm interested <laughs> uh, but just don't them, pay me in your coin. <laughs> not, not only in your coin. <laughs> I, I like that you're confident in your coin, but. <laughs> yes. So one of those is not really a crypto. It's called Initiative Q. And it's kind of a Hayekian 
project where the issuer is going to try to stabilize the purchasing power by changing the quantity as necessary, but very much human hands-on and not algorithmic. Uh, and the other one, but I haven't talked to them in about a year, uh, is Beam, which is a privacy coin. Um, and they've been up and down in terms of market cap, but uh, my advice to them was try to find some way to make this more transactable than other coins, and then you can make a pitch to people that there's a good chance that you'll be adopted at some day as a more widespread uh, medium, because if you're just another store of value, it's hard to differentiate yourself. What do you think, um, maybe a, a top three sort of priorities or attributes of a money that, that make it more transactable in your opinion? Or however many you like, but just I was wondering what the top three might be. Well, there are the sort of the concrete transaction costs of uh, releasing ownership and directing the ownership to the person who's receiving it. So the, you know, the archaic technology was handing over a coin. Banking systems came along and made it much more convenient to write checks or initiate Jiro payments and Today, of course, it can all be done online, deposit transfer. Uh, secondly is the stability of purchasing power, uh, at least low volatility from day to day, week to week. Um, and, and then I think a third, and this is sort of lurking in the background, is some basis for confidence that the stability of purchasing power will be maintained and we're not just in a lucky phase. And so it's that third thing that I worry about the current day fiat monies, because there's no constitutional rule. There's nothing that limits the Fed's discretion. There's no guarantee that we won't return to double digit inflation. And in terms of, you know, preserving purchasing power being an important aspect of, uh, of adopting it for transactions, what is it that gives it its purchasing power in the first place, it, it, these, these uh, potential currencies that we're talking about? Well, it's supply and demand. So the volatility of purchasing power is gonna depend on the volatility of demand and the, uh, you might say the flatness of the supply curve. So that when there's a change in demand, does the action take place in the purchasing power dimension or does it take place in the quantity dimension? And if, if more money is forthcoming whenever more money, uh, whenever the public wants to hold more of that money, then that'll help preserve the stability of the purchasing power. And that's uh, the great virtue of a free banking system where you have competition among different banks. Uh, if people want to hold more of the banknotes issued by Bank X, Bank X will be happy to issue more. And across the banking system if people want to hold more bank issued money of whatever brand the banks will be happy to issue more and competition will compel them to withdraw it from circulation if the public doesn't want to hold it because the public has the option to redeem it for some more basic money mm -hmm. so you get that kind of stabilizing force um, I like to ref then this was understood at least as far back as Ludwig von Mises' theory of money and credit in 1914. Um, but underlying the banking system is the basic money and uh, the attractive feature of a gold standard is that in the long run, the supply curve is pretty flat. You can get more gold without much of an increase in its purchasing power. More so in the long run and in the short run, but mm -hmm. definitely over 10 to 20 years. What, what would you say is the relationship or the importance of the cost to produce a money to its market value? Well, in equilibrium, uh, price equals cost of production. But from an Austrian perspective, it's the willingness to the public to pay that determines the purchasing power and the cost will adjust to that. Mm -hmm. So in a gold standard, uh, the amount of gold mining that goes on will depend on the purchasing power of gold as determined by the interaction of supply and demand. Right. And so 
you know, if, if it's, so then we have to think if it's dependent upon the willingness of the public to pay, then it, we do have to consider what, what influences that willingness on behalf of the individual or the public to value or demand a given currency. And I think, right. correct, me if, correct me if I'm wrong, but p potentially one of the reasons why uh, gold was successful as money is because part of an individual's demand for it was because they knew that, be, because of its scarcity, and they knew that um, it, it wasn't easily, more of it wasn't easily created, at, you know, it, at great cost was more created, and that contributed to um, their demand for it. Yeah, and they didn't have to, people didn't have to be aware of that in any very explicit way, but they knew that, knew that during their lifetime, the purchasing power hadn't changed much. Sure, sure. Really basic question. When, we, when we're talking about the purchasing power of gold, are we talking about purchasing fiat? No, I'm talking about in terms of goods and services. How many ounces of gold it takes to buy a standard basket of goods and services, like the CPI bundle. Right, okay. Um, but to make that purchase, you would have to go via fiat to, to do that. Oh, today, now that gold yep. is demonetized, but back under a gold standard, you could hand mm -hmm. over physical gold or claims to vaulted gold. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, sorry, I just wanted to clear that up. Thank you. <laughs> um, actually, Lawrence, um, before we wind this up, uh, I wanted to ask you about, um, just because it's a very topical question that uh, I was talking with uh, another podcast guest earlier um, who um, has uh, made an amazing piece of artwork of uh, Plan B's um, stock to flow graph. And in that piece of artwork, um, she, it was very controversial on Twitter. She shredded $4 bills, um, actually 10 in total for the, for the artwork, but filmed herself shredding $4 bills. And that caused um, a huge stir, um, <laughs> as you can imagine, on Twitter. Now, I, what, what, I see you've... If she ate a $10 burrito, would that upset people? <laughs> right, exactly. That was her point. Like, you know, it's my money. I can do what I like with it. But apparently, you know, not. And well, everybody, yes. else, everybody else should thank her because by making dollars more scarce, she's increasing exactly. their purchasing power. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she, shreds, she shreds 10, 10 bucks whilst six and a half trillion is getting printed. I, you know, it's a drop in the ocean. True. But I, I've noticed um, recently on Twitter, you've been talking about um, using currency iconography, uh, you know, to measure institutional quality and um, currency notes issued by um, state authorities. And right. I'm reading directly here for, um, commonly depict symbols of power. Um, could you talk to a little bit about that? And, you know, the, the, the kind of, you know, just to put a little bit more, um, rub a little bit more stank on it, the, 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 kind <laughs> of, <laughs> the kind of brainwashing that we've endured as societies over the last God knows however many years with, with this kind of uh, subliminal messaging on, on our fiat banknotes. Right. So initially banknotes were not a creation of the state. They were invented by private commercial banks and they weren't actually very decorated in the early days, but as banks were competing and trying to make their notes more attractive, they started putting attractive images on them, but they had no interest in propagandizing on behalf of the government. So they had pictures of people plowing and railroads in the United States uh, was a common theme. And, and there are still private bank notes uh, that I referred to in this tweet that uh, in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, it's mostly dragons on the banknotes. Uh, and in Macau, I don't really know what the currency in Macau looks like, but in Northern Ireland and in Scotland, they have the famous poets, Robert Burns. They have scientists, Lord Kelvin, and other cultural heroes. They don't put uh, dead politicians on their banknotes and they don't glorify uh, the state they're trying to create a kind of positive, cheerful, optimistic image. Uh, but when the state took over and uh, the issue of banknotes, 
then we got, actually it's a repetition of what we got when the state took over coinage, which was they began to put their own pictures, uh, pictures of statesmen and generals uh, on the face of the currency um, as a way of making it, uh, I don't know, more somber or more serious or at least in the United States, uh, there's a rule that you don't put anybody living on the currency. <laughs> so it's sort of the long run glorification of the state rather than of any living politician. But in, uh, you know, countries with uh, one party rule, it's often the current leadership who are depicted on the banknotes. And so very much the way Caesar used it, it's very much uh, propaganda on behalf of the glory of the current government. Yeah, another, another fly in the ointment of uh, fiat currency. <laughs> well, guys, um, how do you feel? Um, uh, Lawrence, we, we should give the floor to you in case, um, you know, you, I don't want you to feel as though you've been ganged up on here and, um, you know, kind of dragged across the coals. So if, if no, you not at all. Great. That's, uh, that was never, ever the intention. I really enjoyed our talk, Lawrence. Uh, do you want to direct your, your, our listeners um, to any pages, like besides your Twitter handle? Yeah, so my Twitter handle is Lawrence H. White one. Uh, I have a page at uh, altm.org, which is the yeah. blog of the Cato Institute. Uh, there it is. The Center for Monet Alternative, Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Uh, I haven't been blogging there as much as uh, I used to. I, I, usually it's once a month and I need to pick up, up the pace to get back to that. But uh, there have been a lot of distractions in recent weeks. <laughs> yeah. Watching the price of Bitcoin. <laughs> but uh, anybody who wants to see endless uh, lectures of mine, just Google my name, Lawrence H. White, and there are plenty. Well, Lawrence, um, I'm, uh, I just want to thank you for taking the time to uh, have this chat today. I'm glad our, our Twitter back and forth uh, manifested in this. And uh, I'll just further say, uh, look forward to our discussion in 10 years' time. Maybe okay, best you. wishes. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Lawrence. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Have a good evening. So what do you guys think about this discussion with Lawrence H. White uh, in this special Bitcoin podcast is Roundtable Edition uh, together with John Vallis and Daniel Prince, both uh, my some of my favorite Bitcoin podcasters. It's really important to question, you know, where are we going? Why are we doing this? Why Bitcoin? What are the root causes? Um, do we, what's our wish, our desire to create, um, to evolve into? And sometimes I think maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's really good that Bitcoin is not really deeply in its totality comprehended, understood by people. Um, maybe Bitcoin needs to do its own thing. Maybe there's a reason why Bitcoin is still, you know, underestimated, not understood, or, you know, the power is not really um, felt. So with all the pain points that are now, you know, more and more coming to the surface because of this, you know, rotten, sick, um, destructive, kleptocratic, uh, monetary economical system, uh, talking about, you know, pun intended, central banks, nation states, governments, and, you know, the whole centralized entities and structures and causing inflation, hyperinflation, theft on a, you know, on a scale which we probably can't even calculate, you know, the constant printing of trillions and trillions and trillions of, of, of fiat money, the constant debt credit expansion, um, the, the destruction of economies, um, the, the, you know, the destruction of, 
of existence, of livelihoods. So this is why you know I see uh, an unexpected evolution of Bitcoin, not only as a store of value, but as a media exchange. And it will happen, I think, much faster than we could even imagine. Because, you know, that's this is why it's my top priority for myself is to educate also as much as many merchants, businesses, shop owners, people, you know, who have businesses um, to adopt these technologies, these platforms. And I know, yeah, we got to still work on the user friendliness, on, on the simplicity of it, of, you know, of taking away the fear and empowering uh, uh, the people around us, whether it's the average customer, user, merchant, shop owner. And with all the conditions now unfolding, um, credit expansion, you know, inflation, uh, the printing of trillions and trillions and trillions of fiat, um, there is, you know, it's inevitable. So the, the, that's the question, you know, what unique monetary properties does Bitcoin have? And it, well, it is unique. Bitcoin is, that's why Bitcoin is so unique compared to gold, because you got to ask yourself whether you're, you know, you own or possess gold, how, you know, how are you going to validate it? How are you going to audit it? Uh, how can you rely on some numbers that are given to you? How are you going to transport it, especially electronically? Can it, you know, how are you going to trade with it? How are you going to valid, validate, assay the authenticity? Um, what about the centralization? What about the, you know, the danger and threat of confiscation, which we had, you know, in 33 uh, with Roosevelt? Um, uh, and anyway, so let us know your questions, your comments. Why do you think, um, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? Uh, what do you think uh, needs to be needs to happen? Um, how can we, you know, accelerate the the empowerment, the the monetary evolution of Bitcoin, so more and more people start um, at least, you know, just hodling uh, a fraction of Bitcoin. How can we inspire and educate and, and empower more and more merchants, businesses, shop owners? to embrace this technology and this, uh, and, and, uh, you know, the, the applications for Bitcoin and start, you know, doing transactions with the customers by giving them, you know, a discount, for example, which a lot of people would do. So people are ready. I'm, I'm seeing it. I'm feeling it. I, I can observe it. A lot of Bitcoiners can, can, can testify to that, that there are more and more people waking up. They're questioning a lot of things now, even gold holders. They're asking me, you know, they're at, starting to ask, you know, what is what is going to happen to gold? What if we truly find, I mean, that could happen because technology is so exponential by order of magnitude and not only deflationary, you know, you, you will pay, you know, you're paying less and less and less for better and, you know, more advanced and, uh, uh, and, uh, and zero to one technologies, which, which will happen now in the next years and decades to come. Uh, beyond our imagination. So let us know your questions, your comments, your feedback, or whether you would like to have any special guest next on, on our podcast, this roundtable panel discussions. And yeah, thanks so much for support and for listening. Make sure you follow us on Twitter. Um, it's all in the show notes and, and yeah. Thanks so much for listening and for your support and let us know your, your feedback and your questions. Mm -hmm.